The Bronze Bow by Elizabeth George Spear Chapter 6 Daniel turned his face toward the mountain. He intended to leave this city and never set foot in it again. Instead, smarting from Hezron's dismissal, dreading to face Rosh, smoldering with resentment against himself and the world, he blundered straight into trouble. At a crossroads he came to a well, and, seeing a broken bowl nearby, he went down on his knees to scoop up water. Before he could even cool his tongue, a shadow fell across his bent shoulders. He saw, close behind him, the dark, wet flanks of a horse, and looked straight up into the face of a Roman. "'Water for the hoist, horse, boy,' the soldier ordered. "'Not unpleasantly. We have come a long way.' Daniel stiffened. But he noticed, against his will, the heaving sides of the overridden animal, the streaks of foam on the glossy neck. The beast, too, was helpless in the hands of the Roman. He could not deny it water. He lifted the bowl and held it steady, while the animal quenched its thirst. Enough, the Roman barked. You will give him a swollen belly, now some for me. Daniel hesitated. Then, sullenly, he lifted the bowl toward the man. A vicious kick, missing its aim, sent a shower of drops through the air. Impudent scum, the man roared. Fresh water! Daniel's hatred brimmed over. Without a thought, he hurled the contents of the bowl straight into the man's face. For the space of a breath, he stood paralyzed. Then his wits came back and he ran. There was a shout behind him. A stunning blow against his ribs sent him staggering, and a spear clattered in the road just ahead of him. He regained his feet and ran on, ducked behind a stone wall, ran bent over under its shelter for a way, and then made a dash for a clump of trees. There was more shouting now and the thud of feet. He dared not look back. He reached the trees and then a row of houses, saw an alleyway open before him and fled along it. The feet pounded after him. At the end of the alley he dodged one way and then another. He was running uphill now, and his breath was coming short. He stumbled, righted himself. He crawled low over a wall and crouched behind it to catch his breath, pressing hard against the pain in his ribs. His hands came away, sticky and red. He saw that he was in a garden, and that opposite him a ladder led up to the terrace above. He barely managed the ladder, but it gave him a moment at moment's advantage. He could still hear the running feet, but he dared now to climb more slowly and conserve his breath. He gained the next terrace and then the next. He stopped, finally, gasping, and leaned against a terrace wall. He had outrun them. In the quiet orchard there was no sound of pursuit. But... He had used up almost all his strength. Pain gripped his whole chest now, and ran down his arm into his fingers. Very soon he would have to lie down and wait for them to find him. Where could he go? Down there in that huddle of houses there was someone who might give him shelter. But Roche had warned him against trusting even their fellow Jews. Roman methods were too sure. Would any man hide a stranger, knowing what it might mean to his family? No, he must keep on the hill. The Romans would not be so likely to look up here. An icy fog kept drifting over his eyes. In panic he realized that he was not even thinking clearly. He clung now to one chance, and he knew that that chance had been in his mind all along, and had directed his feet even when he was running too fast to think. If he could get to Yoel, Yoel would take him in. 
He didn't know why he was sure of this, but on that first day on the mountain he had trusted Yoel. He never remembered how he got to the door in the long wall, or how he had sensed enough to pull the folds of his robe to cover the dark stain that spread down his side. Afterwards he recalled that the doorman admitted him and went to summon Yoel. But as he stood for the second time in the outer hallway he was not thinking at all, only concentrating on staying on his feet. Presently he heard a step on the courtyard paving, and a figure approached him, wavering and indistinct against the light. Then his eyes focused, and he saw that once again it was not Yoel, but Malthes. She, had, she came toward him swiftly. Daniel, she said, you must go away quickly. Yoel is not here. He and father have gone to the synagogue, but he may be back at any moment. Daniel's wits moved slowly. He could not quite take in what she was saying, but he perceived that this one chance had failed. Still, he could not seem to move. "'Don't you understand?' she said sharply. "'If Father finds you here, he will have no patience. Why did you come back anyway?' He forced himself to one more attempt. "'I must see you well,' he said, his voice harsh. It's important. Nothing is so important as Yoel's studies, she flared. If you cared anything about Yoel, you would leave him alone. He can be a famous rabbi some day. He's not going to risk his whole future for a band of outlaws. Daniel looked at her stupidly. Her voice seemed to be coming from farther and farther away. "'Can't you see?' she cried. "'Yoel is torn in two directions, but he knows what is right. "'Please, Daniel, I beg you, go away and leave him alone.' "'Briefly the mist cleared. "'He realized that once again he had blundered. "'The girl was right. "'He could only bring danger and trouble for Yoel. "'He turned away saw the door wavering and dissolving into the wall, took two steps toward it, and plunged headlong into blackness. Consciousness returned slowly. At first he was unaware of something soft under his head. For the moment that was enough, and he lay motionless, while pain flowed in again across his chest and side. Finally, as the sharpening pain prodded him awake, he was able to open his eyes. It must be night. He could see nothing in the blackness. Then he realized that someone was bending over him, and gropingly he made out a woman's head with dark masses of hair, her face a white blur in the dimness. Then he remembered and struggled to move. Instantly the sick blackness roared over him. After a time it started all over again. The pain, the groping, the face of the girl still looking down at him. Where am I? he asked carefully, not moving. Hush, Malthus whispered. Don't speak out loud. You're in a storage room. The words reached him from a great distance. He lay, trying to grasp their meaning. Daniel, she whispered again, can you hear me? Yes. I'm going to go and get something for your wound. Just lie still and don't make any noise. I'll come as soon as I can. Do you understand? Yes. There was a rustling and a streak of light, then blackness again. He understood only that she had gone and that he did not need to move. After a time, the streak of light fell across him again. The girl was bending over him once more. Are you awake? she whispered. Here, drink this. I'll hold it for you. The cool rim of a cup touched his lips. A gentle hand lifted his head. The wine was strong with an unfamiliar, bitter taste. 
It spread warmly down his throat into his chest, pushing back the pain. She set down the cup. Now, I'll have to pull away this cloth. I'll try not to hurt you. He clenched his teeth while she slowly eased the blood-stiffened tunic from his ribs. The wine made his head swim. He suspected there must have been medicine in it. He was aware that she was sponging his side, and he smelled the pungent odor of dill and the sweetish fragrance of oil, and felt a soft, dry cloth against his side. "'How did I get here?' he murmured. I dragged you in. Why didn't you tell me you were hurt? Yoel would never have forgiven me if I... if anything... She fell silent, bound the cloth snugly against him, and held the wine again to his lips. I can't stay any longer, she said then. Yoel will be here soon, and he'll know what to do. Don't move. Just wait till we come. He did not know how long he waited, drifting in a sluggish river. Finally, the crack of light appeared, widened, and when it closed, there was still light. Yoel had brought a candle and the flame lighting up his worried face. Daniel, are you all right? Thank God you came here. I didn't know where Daniel began. Don't talk. I heard what happened. They're searching all over town. When Thace told me, I knew it must have been you. You were crazy, Daniel. Don't make him talk, Yoel. Malthus was close behind. See, Daniel, I brought some gruel for you. Can you eat a little? Yoel held a candle while the girl dipped up spoonfuls of gruel. It tasted warm and good, but the effort was too great. After three attempts, he had to close his eyes and rest. Presently, he forced himself to speak again. I have put your house in danger. No, they'll never think of searching father's house. Let me look at that wound, Daniel. Yoel knelt, knelt down and cautiously pulled away the bandage. He let out a slow whistle. You're lucky. Another inch or so? There's a nasty hole. No use arguing. You'll have to stay quiet. Daniel did not attempt to argue. He knew he could not even get to his feet. I don't think this place is safe, Yoel went on. One of the slaves might come to get any, get grain any moment. There's a passage between the two walls. Thais and I discovered it when we were children visiting here. If we lift you onto a mat and drag you, can you stand it? Yes, he said. He could stand anything in this helpless gratitude. The passage was scarcely two cubits wide. Yoel, stooping over and tugging, with Thasia steadying behind, made slow progress, bumping along the rough earth floor for some distance before Yoel was satisfied. Then he smoothed the mats carefully, while Thasia went back to get grain sacks for a pillow and covering. I hate to leave you in this place, Yoel said, shining the candle beam along the box-like walls. It's not too airy, but you won't suffocate, and I'm sure no one will find you. Daniel tried to stammer his thanks. I wish I could do more, Yoel answered. I'm sorry things went wrong at dinner today. Father isn't like that, really. It's just that he's suspected for a long time how I feel, and he's afraid I'll join the zealots. I talked like a fool, Daniel said. Well, yes, you did, Joel smiled for the first time. But I wish I had the courage to stand up to him like that. If he finds out... He'd never give you away, I'm sure of that, but he would start asking questions about Amalek and the mountain and all, no knowing where it would end. Just stay here and don't worry about it. Thais and I will come whenever we can. Thasia muttered something to her brother. Yes, we have to go, Yoel answered. Will you be all right here alone, Daniel? Yes, said Daniel. I Sleep all you can. I'll be back. 
He lay still while the candlelight and the footsteps receded. Just before the blackness closed down, he thought he heard a whispered voice. Good night, Daniel. He was not sure. And as the fever began to rise in him, he imagined that it had been his mother's voice, speaking the words he had not heard for years. And that's the end of chapter 6.